Continuing our study in the book of Philippians, we'll be in Philippians chapter 1, verses 19 through 30. We'll finish out chapter 1. It took us three weeks to get there, but we finally are finishing it out. And what a way to finish. We looked the first week on what prayer is. Then last week we looked at Paul talking about advancing the gospel and how that we needed to make sure that we rejoice and we're happy when the word is being proclaimed. It doesn't matter who it is. We're not in competition. Paul said, all they did was give me more of a pulpit by putting me in this prison. Because now I've got somebody chained to me 24-7 that I can share the gospel with. But not only that, I'm able to have visitors, so I'm having church here. And the word is being relayed to thousands of people. And so... The message is going out, and because I'm out, it's boldened people to share the gospel, to take up the place. Some were doing it out of selfish reasons. Some were doing it out of envy. Some were even, as we see today, preaching a false gospel. And we saw that Paul said, let them be cursed, and the judgment of God fall upon them for preaching a false gospel. And there's churches, and I use the word loosely, preachers that are in pulpits today that are sharing a false gospel, a false Christ, a false God. But I can guarantee you one day God's judgment will fall upon them. And when it falls, it will fall hard, and they will be in a world of trouble. Because when you are cursed by God, it's not the, I curse you. It's, there is no hope for you. So we need to make sure that what is being preached and proclaimed and that we're studying and we're reading lines up with what the Word of God says. And if it doesn't, and, the, and it's not, they just misinterpreted or misquoted a verse. It's the whole line of teaching is false. If that's the case, you need to run far away from that place, far away from that teaching, because that's not advancing the gospel. That's not even preaching Christ. That's preaching yourself and leading people astray. And so we need to make sure that we're not there. But Paul starts in verses 19 through 30, and we'll look at the uh, just for 26 today. And on Wednesday, we'll see uh, 26, 27 through 30. But Paul is saying, there is something that I want you to know. There is something that I live for. So let me ask you the question this morning. If you had to fill in the blank, how would you fill this in? For me to live is blank. So think about it. What are some words that you would use to fill in that blank? For me to live is blank. Blank. So if you got your scripture, let's pick up Philippians chapter 1. We'll finish out verse 18 and go to the end of the chapter. And stand with me as we have. Picking up in the middle of the verse. Yes, I will continue to rejoice. Because I know this will lead to my salvation through your prayers and help from the Spirit of Jesus Christ. My eager expectation and hope is that I will not be ashamed about anything, but that now, as always, with all courage, Christ will be highly honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, if I live on in the flesh, this means fruitful work for me, and I don't know which one I should choose. I am torn between the two. I long to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Since I am persuaded of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that because of my coming to you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus may 
just one thing. As citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or am absent, I will hear about you, that you are standing firm in one spirit, in one accord, contending together for the faith of the gospel, not being frightened in any way by your opponents. This is a sign of destruction for them, but of your salvation. And this is from God, for it has been granted to you on Christ's behalf, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you are engaged in the same struggle that you saw I had, and now here that I have. And be seated. I like that. There's a lot of richness in that passage. And so let me go back. What are you living for? For me to live is blank. We all live for something. There's something that drives us, something that we're passionate about. You ask various people, uh, you get various answers. Thursday started the Major League Baseball season. A lot of people are happy because sports are finally back on and we're not watching 1960s baseball. It's interesting watching now because there's nobody in the stands, so it's either cardboard cutouts or it's virtual people sitting in the stands. But if you ask a baseball player, what do you live for? He said, for me to live is baseball. You ask uh, Bill Gates, he would say, for me to live is Microsoft. You ask uh, Mark Zuckerberg, he would say, for me to live is Facebook. It could be family. It could be my job. It could be uh, to see my grandchildren, to have a happy, a happy life, to be financially secure. And there's nothing wrong with those answers. But ultimately, every single one of those will fail you. Up until... On Friday, there was no guarantee there was going to be an NFL football season. So if you answer, for me to live is the NFL, and there's no season, does that mean you cease to live? If that's your life, and everything you do is wrapped up in it. See, what Paul is saying here is it's not just what do you live for. What are your goals and aspirations? What would you like to see happen in your life? That's not what he's asking. He says, where is your passions? Where is your hope? Where is everything? And he says, for me to live is Christ. So let's dive in and see the first road sign that we come to this morning is living to exalt Christ. That's what Paul lives for, is to exalt Christ. And as believers, we should be the same way, that we are living, no matter what the world says, no matter what's going on around us, we should live to exalt Jesus Christ. Because when the world is full of turmoil, when the world is full of trouble, and everything is falling apart around us, there is a sure foundation of Jesus Christ that the writer of Hebrews tells us in chapter 13 that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, he's the same today, and he'll be the same forever. So if he never changes, then why are we exalting everybody else? Why can't we exalt Christ? See, you had the the representative from Georgia, uh, I mean from Alabama, uh, John Lewis, who passed away uh, this week from cancer, starting this morning at 11 o'clock and going all the way for a whole week, we're celebrating the memory and the legacy of this man. And it's starting in Selma, Alabama today, and talking about all the things that he did for the civil rights movement, 
talking about all the different things he had to go through to endure leading up to his time in Congress and up to his death. And there's nothing wrong with that. He, he accomplished a whole lot of great things in this world. And I'm not taking anything from him. I'm not diminishing him at, any, at all. But if we're going to exalt a man for a whole week that's dead and is not coming back, why is it that even for an hour on a Sunday, we can't exalt the Christ who saved us, died for us, and rose again never to die again? Why is it we can only barely squeeze out any time for him? That's not exalting Christ. That's not living for Christ. If we live for Christ, everything that we do exalts and points to the risen Savior. Paul says here in verse 18, Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. How are you able to rejoice, Paul? You are chained to a guard. Sure, you get to sleep in a bed. You get to sleep uh, in a house. You're not in a jail cell. But you're in jail. You're a prisoner. You can't go to Walmart. You can't go to United. You can't even get a chicken sandwich from McDonald's. You are stuck. What are you talking about joy? Remember what we said in our study in the book of James. Joy is not a feeling or a sensation. That's what happiness is. You win the lotto, you're happy. You get fed today, you're happy. When we're on a vacation, we'll be happy because we're enjoying being away from the cares and the stresses of life. We're just enjoying things. We're happy. But joy is an attitude that comes from Christ because we can only be joyful when we know that there's somebody watching us, protecting us, guiding us, and going to lead us through to the other side. That's why we can have joy in the midst of the storm. That's why we can have joy through everything. While I'm sitting in this jail cell and people are out there preaching God's word, I can be joyful. And I'm telling you, yes, I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to rejoice and throw a party. Because Christ is being proclaimed. Because that's, to me, all that matters. Nothing else matters to me. I want Christ proclaimed. And I'll do whatever it takes to do that. Paul doesn't know what's going to happen to him. In the book of Acts, uh, chapter 26, right at the end, he appeals to Caesar while sitting in a jail cell in Caesarea. He appeals to Caesar to take his case, and so he's voted over. He's shipwrecked. And he's sitting here waiting for trial before Caesar Nero, knowing pretty much that his fate is sealed, that he will be dead. He's hoping and praying that God will allow him out of this Roman prison so that he can visit this church at Philippi that he loves. But he has no clue and knows pretty much deep down that he's on borrowed time. While I've got breath in my lungs, I will exalt the Lord Savior. Look at verse 19. It tells us, because I know that this will lead to my deliverance through your prayers and the help from the Holy Spirit. Because I know it will lead to my deliverance. Some translations put it to my salvation. While he's hoping and longing that he will be set free. That's not the deliverance 
for the salvation that he's relying upon. He knows that if I am rejoicing in God, then whatever this world throws at me, I'm delivered from. Because my cares and my troubles aren't with this world. This world isn't where I live. My body just dwells and takes up space on this earth, but my heart and my soul live in heaven. So I know that me rejoicing is going to deliver me from whatever the world throws at me because my focus isn't on what the world has for me. My focus is on what God has for me. And he rejoices. The actual root word for deliverance is where we get the word salvation from. We can't be saved or delivered when we're bogged down with worry and fret. But boy, can we be delivered and saved when we put our trust and our hope and our joy in Christ Jesus. Then we see his commitment to exalt Christ in verse 20. He tells us in verse 20, whether by life or by death, by life or by death, I mean, that's pretty, that's tough. He says, I hope that I will not be ashamed. If somebody asked you today, like they did Cassie Bernal, with a gun to your head, do you believe in Christ? If you say yes, I want to blow your head off. Would you be ashamed? Or would you say, you better pull the trigger? Now that's an extreme position. But what about when we're with our friends? with our families or we're at work are we ashamed to be recognized as a Christian man? or do we keep silent or do we speak up for Christ the church has been silent for so long it doesn't even look like the church anymore one of the best things that ever happened to the church is Corona hit. It doesn't force the church to wake up and stop being a country club and start being the body of Christ. See, here's the thing. If we don't speak up, we're basically saying, I'm ashamed to be known. And it's not wearing a cross around your neck that's speaking up. It's not even wearing a Christian t-shirt that's speaking up. I don't have a Christian shirt on today, but I can speak up. I can speak up in a lot of ways by the way that we dress. We're showing the world everything that we got. We're not speaking for Christ. We're speaking for ourselves. Hey, look at me. Trust me, most of the people that are doing that, nobody wants to see all that anyway. What we need to do is speak Christ with everything that we have. Like uh, St. Francis of Assisi said, preach always use words when necessary. See, Paul was given the option, just like James, John, and Peter were given the option, we'll leave you alone, we'll let you go free, just shut up about this guy that you're talking about. 
Don't speak about Christ and we'll let you go free and we'll leave you alone. Remember what John and Peter said? We mean no disrespect to you, but we can't help but speak and tell about what we've seen and heard. Peter had a first hand close encounter with Christ and he couldn't keep quiet. In the book of Acts we see he's preaching a message. The guy falls out of the out of the window and they preached so long the guy fell asleep sitting in the windowsill fell out, died Paul goes down there, brings them back to life. They come back to the room and he keeps preaching on some more. All Paul wants to do is to share Christ with everyone he comes into contact with. So what are we doing? We exalt Christ by our attitudes, by our actions. Would people know that we are Christians if they just watched us for one day? Instagram is an interesting little thing because you'll have different organizations that somebody will take over their page for a day and you get to see what they do for a day. Of course, we make it look good. We don't show that we sat on the couch and gorged on potato chips and binge watch TV all day. We don't show that one. We see us going out to the lake, to the beach. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But if somebody watched our life for one day, we didn't know that they were watching. In camera. How would because if we act different than what we do if there's a camera following us then there's something wrong because here's the thing it's not a camera that's following us and watching us but God is watching everything we do he's watching everything we say and so is the world the reason why so many people can't stand the church. What's the biggest excuse why people don't come to church? It's full of hypocrites. Remember there was a song that came out back in the early 90s by a group called DC Talk called In the Light. And it starts out at the very beginning with a quote that says, the greatest cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who profess Christ with their mouth and deny the him by their lifestyle. Our lives should be exalting Christ. Period. Paul is sitting here in a jail cell saying, I have a desire to come to you. He doesn't say, I have a desire to be free. I have a desire to be free of this guard that's stuck to me. I have a desire so that I can go and eat pizza or so I can have some baked fish. That's not what his desire is. My desire is so that I can come and be with you and be with the fellowship, the believers, but so that I can tell others about this Christ who set me free while I'm sitting in a prison cell. You see, not only are we living to exalt Christ, the next road sign that we come to says that we're living to serve others. We're living to serve others that are around us. That's why in verse 21, Paul issues that famous state, that famous verse that we know so much out of the book of Philippians. For me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. 
But for a lot of people, that doesn't make sense. How many people are excited about looking forward to death? Not the afterlife. Not what comes after death. But who's looking forward to dying? I'm ready to die. Throw me in the grave. I'm ready. I'm not talking about when you're in tremendous pain and death seems like the only way to get out of it. Just on a regular, every day, your best day that you've had in a long time. I'm ready to die. Just let me die right now. Even if there is no afterlife, when you die, you're dead. That's it. How many of us look forward and plan and calculate our death? Kind of morbid. Kind of twisted. Now, it's okay to plan ahead and make sure that you have arrangements ready and all of that. That's, that's being wise. But you don't sit down, okay, I'm going to make sure I die on this day. don't do that. See, most people focus on the end of that verse. To die is gain. Because we know what Paul was talking about. For me to die is gain because I'll be in heaven. And we can't wait for that day. That's why I said, who looks forward to death? Not what's after. Because you have to be pretty messed up not to be ready to experience heaven. No more pain, no more suffering, no more agony, no more world's problems, no more disputes and issues. But we shouldn't look at, overlook what comes first. For me to live is Christ. So what does that mean? To live is Christ. Doesn't even say to be Christ. It says is Christ. Meaning, we go back to the true definition of what Christianity was. A copy of you look at what the I-A-N means when you add something to it. Like, we are a Texan. The A-N means that we are of Texas. We look like Texas. We smell like Texas. We be Texas. You, that's why when you say that you move somewhere else, like that saying goes, I may go somewhere else, but you can't take the Texan out of it. Because it's who you are. When we become a Christian, we become a copy of Christ. The question is, how much of a copy do we stay? Because when we say yes and accept Christ, immediately immediately we look identical to Christ. You can't tell us apart. Then we take a breath. Then life happens. For too many, unfortunately, life happens and we fall so far away that we're on polar opposites. We don't look anything like Christ. But Paul is saying, to live means I'm proclaiming the gospel to everyone I meet. See, Paul, to show the advancement of the gospel, he was thrown in prison. Yet, because of his appeals... He was brought before princes. He was brought before kings. He was brought before rulers, magistrates. So he had a wide range of people that if he wasn't in prison, he wouldn't have been able to reach. Hence the reason why he says, all they did was just give me a pulpit. 
I've got more people to reach than I ever could being out on the streets. But since I can't be on the streets, somebody else is picking up the mailing. Glory be to God for that. See, he didn't have a desire to just be content with his little realm. He wanted more people to know about the gospel. We shouldn't be content with just our little realm here. We need to be content. We should not be content until the ends of the world are reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why I get so excited when we send our money to the missionaries. Our little church. In the midst of Corona, in the midst of Corona, not having church for months, all of April, the majority of March, so basically two full months, no service at all. We still, and it doesn't sound like a whole lot, but for our church it's a lot. We were still able to send $240 to each missionary group. And that doesn't sound like a whole lot. That's $240 that they didn't have that they can use to reach lost souls to Christ. I love talking to our friends in uh, Arizona on the Indian uh, tribe as they minister to them that the majority of those tribes from the southern tip of Arizona never heard the gospel. Maybe one person in the entire tribe has heard of Jesus Christ. They worship all these gods. They don't know the one true God. They have a burning desire to reach all of those tribes. They're doing such a phenomenal work there but in the northern part of the state, they're getting phone calls. Can you pray for us? Can you help us? And because they have a true desire that Christ be exalted and live for serving others, they don't say, well, you're not in our area. You're not who we're called to. They say, sure. Let me see what we can do for you. You see, that's what we should have, is our desire for us to live is making sure that somebody else is better off than we are. As parents, that's what our desire is for our children, is that our kids have a better life than what we have. They're happier, they're stronger, they have more things than what we do. Not stuck not stuff, but the important things. Why is it every generation wants their kids to have a better education, a better home, a better life? But the only better that can even come close to accomplishing the truth of that is if every generation makes sure that every person in that generation has accepted Christ. Because without Christ, there is no better. It just gets worse. So for us to live is to know that without Christ, all we have is death to look forward to. But then it gets worse. But for a believer, to live as Christ means I am going to mirror Christ's image. Christ didn't discriminate. He saw a broken woman on the side of the road who had an issue of blood for 12 years, exhausted her resources. According to their standard and their custom, she was an unclean woman. But she didn't, Jesus didn't look at her and say, don't touch me. 
You're unclean. Stay away. He knelt down to her after she had touched just the hem of his garment. The child, your faith has made you well. The sick were brought to him. The diseased were brought to him. The dead were brought to him. Jesus couldn't show up to a funeral and they stay a funeral. Every funeral he showed up to ended up being a party. As he walks in and death leaves, including the grave. See, Jesus cared about others. He was tired. He was wore out after he preached on the side of the hill. And he looked out, and the scripture says he was moved with compassion when he saw their need. And he tells his disciples, You try to give them the example. You go get them something to eat. You really want to serve me? You go do it. See, Christianity is never a sit down type of relationship, it's busy work. Not the busy work we had in school when we had a substitute. It's a busy work to build the kingdom of God. To keep us active. To grow. Everything that Jesus did and said, that's what we should do and say. Paul's purpose in living here on earth was to serve others so that they, too, could know Christ. Then we come to verse two, 22. He says, if I live on in the flesh, this means fruitful work for me. If I still live here, that's great. That's good. That means I can still share the gospel with others. Of course, if I die, that means I'll be present with God. That's great for me. So I'm torn between the two. I long to be with my master. But if I'm here, that's better for you. Because there's somebody that doesn't know that Jesus loves them. Not just because the Bible says so. Because Jesus died on the cross for them. It means as long as I, we are here on this earth, we need to be doing something. The writer Henry James said, the best use of your life is to invest it in something that will outlast it. That's why people set up foundations. That's why you always hear, what is your legacy? You want something that's going to live on after you. Unfortunately, some legacies live on longer than we would want them. So what are we doing? What kind of legacy are we leaving? When Paul died, he left behind churches that were started in the name of Christ. You don't have any church that he ever started that is named the Paul Church. I would be happy and content if there was no buildings that were ever named after me. I didn't build them. You don't want me building your building. So me and Dad forever just put up a door. You don't want me. We might could build it. We'll just leave the doors off and let somebody else come in and do that. You don't want us putting up electrical work. It's iffy on cement. It's a quick creep. See, what we should be doing is doing everything to share the gospel with others. And verse 23 says, I long to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. 
who wouldn't want to be with Christ? But see, in order to truly serve others, not only do we long to be with Christ, but we long for others to be with us with Christ. And the only way we can do that is by simply telling our story. I was a good kid. I was like any other kid. I had problems. I wasn't perfect. At least that's what people keep telling. But I was a good kid. Raised in church. I knew the answers. When I was about six or seven, me and my cousin had a deal going on. At that time, that whatever she did, I would do. Whatever I did, she would do. Most of the time, that worked out good for us. Well, I'll eat this if you eat it. Most of the time, that worked out really good until the one time we got a hold of some peppers. We were knocking down each other over the sink trying to wash her mouse out. And she took the sink, I took the bathtub. Dad came in and gave us bananas, and we're like, we don't need a banana. And it worked wonders. You see, sometimes doing what somebody else does doesn't always work out. She went down and asked Jesus to save her. So what's the natural thing? My turn. When they ask him a simple question. Well, do you know that Jesus loves you? Yes. Do you know that he died on the cross for you? Yes. Do you know that he uh, that he wants to live in your heart? Yes. All right, let's say this prayer. You'll be saved. Okay, I did it. I knew, knew the answer. But I didn't know. I was 12. Then a revival. I heard. Preacher preaching. On the second coming. One of the reasons why I love the end time so much. I'd gotten in trouble at school, so I missed the whole revival. Having to write sentences. I don't remember what it was. It was probably I'll turn in my homework on time. And complete. Because she was one of those that she won't let you get it all on one line. And it has to be long enough to fill up two so you can't do the eyes, wheel. Yeah. And I begged my mom that last night, please let me be in service. I'll stay up late. I'll, I'll do the sentences. Let me, let me be in. I'd sit there. I'd draw whatever during the service. No big deal. My aunt was sitting next to me, and she said she knew right then that God was going to do something. Because he started talking about the end time. I don't remember anything much about that message. I just remembered I wish he'd stop so I could get down to the front. Because I was glued. Said I was, my aunt says I was coloring little bubbles in on the order of service and he said something and I just put everything down and it was just glued to him. The only thing I remember is he was talking about when Christ comes back and he had his Bible open and he said when Christ returns he slammed the Bible shut. That's the end. There is no more chances. Not the rapture. When Christ comes back onto this earth, the battle of Armageddon, there is no more shot. You're done. He shut that Bible and I knew right then, you need to stop preaching because I need to get to the altar. I remember nothing else about I knew that if I died, I would never make it to heaven. Doesn't matter how good it I am, doesn't matter how well I know the verses, the Bible. I even had a little trophies. I had a couple of trophies at that time where I'd won the Bible challenge at camp. Those don't mean nothing 
if you don't have Jesus living in your heart. All it is is a piece of metal. Doesn't necessarily mean that once you accept Christ, you live it. Play active a lot. I know the answer. Live life. Life happens. You hang around the wrong people. It brings you down. He was Lord in name. But in 2005, I hit a rock bottom. My world came to a crashing halt. And it didn't look like there was any hope in the world. That's when Jesus became Lord. When you have nothing, and everything you built for yourself, everything you have done, comes to a screeching halt and falls apart around you and crumbles, and everybody walks away, and you're left standing with pieces in your hand. Like that song that Tony sang last week, your plans fell through like sand, and you're left with nothing. What do you do? If you live for Christ, Christ is there in the moment. And then you start seeing things in a new way. You start reading the word, not because that's what you do as a believer. You don't read it because you're studying because you've got a lesson to teach. You're studying it to see what God is saying to you. In that time frame, I learned more about God's Word than I did any other time in my life. Because I saw what He wanted to say to me. Not to you. To me. See, that's when it becomes real. That's when we realize that it's serving others regardless of the outcome. Even if they never say thank you, even if they spit at you, that doesn't matter. It's serving others that makes the world of difference. But these are Jesus' words. I want you to hear them very closely. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. It says, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. If we are to live not as Christ, but to live, to live is Christ. For me, to live is Christ. Then we must be willing to to serve others, and to give our lives, if necessary, as a ransom for me. We can share, serve by sharing resources, offering our skills, visiting sick, babysitting, carpooling, sharing the gospel, leading Bible studies. So let's go back to that question that I asked you at the very beginning. What is the answer for you? To live is life. I would say there's no right or wrong answer, but there is. what that blank is. 
And unfortunately, for all of us in this room and all of us watching online, that blank rarely is Christ. Now, we live for him, but we're not living for him like this is talking about. To really know what the answer to that blank is, look at your time. What do you use the majority of your time doing? If you had all the time in the world, what would you want to do most? That's what to live is. Paul was clear and focused on his purpose. He knew that he was what he was living for. He knew who he was living for. He was living to exalt Christ. He was living to serve others. As believers, we need to honestly evaluate our lives in light of this question. What am I living for today? If you knew at 3 o'clock this afternoon, you would be dead. Three o'clock, that doesn't give you much time. What changes would you make? What mistakes would you try to fix? And how would you want to spend the last fleeting moments that you have left? Paul said, I'm not ashamed. He tells a young Timothy that my life is about to be poured out. I'm on very limited time. I have fought the good fight. I ran the race. I finished my course. I have no regrets. Except that didn't tell me. May that be our regret. That we didn't share the gospel. But that we live our lives sharing the gospel, but we didn't share it at all. May that be our one regret. Nobody dies wishing they spend more time at work or on the golf course or staying away from their family. I wish they spent more time with their family. But what better legacy to leave than to take your family with you sharing the gospel, living the gospel, so that we can say the same thing to our family that Jesus said to his disciples. Where I go, you can go to. So the question is up to you. What are you living for? Are you living for Christ? Or are you living for self? Because here's the thing it really does matter. We can't do both. And if we're not following Christ and living for Him, we'll never truly serve others. And if we're not living for Him, we'll never truly love Him. I hope and pray that all of us will live to exalt Christ and to serve others. So that we can confidently say, not one day, not someday, but every day, for me to live 
is Christ only. Because nothing else in this world matters. Because here's the thing, if Christ doesn't matter to you, your family doesn't even matter. Now that's harsh. But if we don't have that burning desire for the world to know without a shadow of a doubt that no matter how much you messed up, no matter how far you think you have fallen, God still loves you. There is absolutely nothing you can say or do that will turn God's love off of you. I mean, he loves you so much with an undying love that he sent his very best. Better than Kay, better than Jared's, he sent the very best in Jesus Christ to die on a cross for everything that we've done wrong. And in the process, he wants to set us free from that pain and the regret of our past so that we can have a future living for him and with him. All we have to do is simply ask him to forgive us of our sins to wash us white as snow and give us his spirit and his joy to live inside of us. And in exchange, he will do that. He will free us. And we can live for him today and every day. Let us pray. God, we thank you. We love you. Forgive us where we have not followed you for you. Change whatever our blank is. Let it be in proper place. So with a resounding yes, with not just all sincerity, but with all trust, faith in you to accomplish it. May we say with everything that we have, the need to live is you. Give us strength that when life happens and when the world bombards us, that we won't be ashamed of the gospel. But when the world hits us, we'll just speak that much louder and stronger. Your love, your mercy, your forgiveness, your grace. Because you alone are the only one For those who don't know Christ today. Today is your day for salvation. Today is your day that you can make that statement for me to live is Christ. If you haven't made that decision, or maybe you have and you're not living up to that and want to rededicate your life to him. Then I encourage you to do that. Repeat this prayer with me. It's not the words, it's the heart behind it. Dear God, forgive me. I'm sorry I failed. I need you. Thank you for sending Christ to die on the cross. For paying the price for me so 
estão lá que eu não lembro comigo. Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. Cleanse me from everything that keeps me from you. I love you. You are my Lord. And I am your child. 